In the hallowed landscape of Normandy, France, the Battle of Cherbourg unfolded as a symphony of thundering naval and ground artillery pummeled the German port defenses. The streets echoed with the rhythmic cadence of gunfire as American GIs closed in on the strategic port city. Pinned beneath the gaze of German pillboxes and unforgiving 88mm flak guns, the Allies faced German audacity and stiff resistance. Amidst the chaos, Corporal John D. Kelly braved a hail of machine gun fire, navigating through enemy defenses with a pole and TNT charges to destroy a pillbox and save his buddies. Lieutenant Carlos C. Ogden, a fearless leader from Fairmount, Illinois, confronted a lethal artillery barrage in another sector. Despite his grievous injuries and a bullet grazing his helmet, Ogden wielded his M1 Garand grenade launcher and advanced towards an 88mm flak gun already damaged by one of his grenades. He aimed to silence it for good. Such was the spirit of the fighting men, led by Lightning Joe Collins, one of the youngest commanders in U.S. military history, tasked with capturing the most crucial port the Allied troops required for the liberation of France. The Allied command had been planning to retake France since 1942, when the United States military joined the fray after the Pearl Harbor attack of December 1941 at the hands of the Japanese. While coming up with the plan for the invasion of France, Allied commanders concluded it was of utmost importance to secure several deep water ports to keep a steady flow of manpower and supplies into Normandy and keep the invasion going without logistical delays. Without them, equipment and manpower would have to be delivered to Great Britain and then unpacked before it could be transferred to shallow water locations in captured territory in northern France. Cherbourg, a port city in the Cotentin Peninsula, was the largest port in Normandy that fulfilled the Allied requirements for a deep water port and was thus critical for the entire operation's success. Allied planners opted against a direct landing on the Cotentin Peninsula due to its separation from the main Allied landings by the flooded Duva River Valley, a German measure to impede airborne landings. However, in January 1944, when British Army General Bernard Montgomery assumed the role of overall land commander, he reintroduced the idea of landing on the Cotentin Peninsula. This decision aimed to broaden the front, preventing the invaders from being confined to a narrow lodgment and facilitating Cherbourg's swift capture. While the bulk of the Allied troops would land at different sectors for D-Day, the 4th Infantry Division and the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions were tasked with one single objective, set the stage for the conquest of Cherbourg and the Cotentin Peninsula. Seasoned warrior American General Joseph Lawton Collins, commander of U.S. Army 7th Corps, was tasked with capturing Cherbourg. It was no easy task. If Lightning Joe Collins had failed to capture the port in time, the Normandy invasion could have resulted in an utter failure for the Allied forces. Joseph Lawton Collins was a veteran United States Army officer. Also known as Lightning Joe, he had served during World War I with distinction and became one of the 280,000 citizens from Louisiana who joined the armed forces in 1941 and 42 to fight the Japanese and Germans. Despite being a difficult task, the capture of Cherbourg fell under capable hands, and Supreme Leader Eisenhower knew it. Lightning Joe had made a name for himself in the Pacific Theater as the commander of the 25th Infantry, the Tropic Lightning Division. Collins's men had fought at Oahu, Guadalcanal, and New Georgia between 1942 and 43 with the desperation of hungry wolves. They had achieved victory against the Empire of Japan through their sweat and blood. At just 46, Lightning Joe became the youngest division commander of the United States Army. The Catholic leader earned the respect of his peers thanks to his aggressive and dashing operations against the enemy. After his campaigns in the Pacific, Collins was called to the European theater by Supreme Allied Commander Eisenhower, where his unique form of commanding was needed to defeat the Wehrmacht. He was given command of the 7th Corps, instantly taking him past another milestone. He became the youngest corps commander in the U.S. Army at age 47. After familiarizing himself with his men, Lightning Joe got ready for D-Day. On June 6, 1944, the commander of the 7th Corps stayed aboard USS Bayfield, a flagship for Utah Beach, while his men attacked the German defenses. The U.S. 82nd and 101st paratroopers landed at the Cotentin Peninsula during the early hours of the Normandy invasion to capture the cherished port of Cherbourg. 
the troopers quickly arrested and secured the routes the 7th Corps would use from Utah to Cherbourg to begin the daunting operation. Lightning Joe went ashore the next day and met with Major General Matthew Ridgway, commander of the 82nd Airborne and an old classmate of his, as the 4th, 9th, 79th, and 90th Infantry Divisions began marching towards Cherbourg. The German garrison at the port of Cherbourg was under General Karl Wilhelm von Schleiben, a World War I veteran and a seasoned Panzer commander since the invasion of France in 1940. Von Schleiben had fought at both the Western and Eastern Fronts with determination since the beginning of the war after the Battle of Kursk, and was tasked with commanding the 709th Static Infantry Division in Normandy, France. On June 23rd, General von Schleiben commanded the entire Cherbourg Fortress, relieving General Major Robert Sattler of the task. Meanwhile, Lightning Joe and his men advanced restlessly towards the objective. Von Schleiben urgently requested air support and reinforcements by air or sea. The 15th Parachute Regiment of Fallschirmjägers was alerted to move from St. Malo to Cherbourg, but transportation was unavailable. Von Schleiben had to make do with a mix of personnel, battered units, and dwindling ammunition. The Führer then ordered Cherbourg to become a fortress to be defended at all costs. Despite determined resistance, the German garrison could not stop the steady progress of the 7th Corps on June 22nd and 23rd. In the final phase, Lightning Joe's three infantry divisions reduced the remaining solid points, seized the last ground commanding the port, and closed in on the battered city. On June 24th, General Collins' orders maintained the previously outlined plans. Flank regiments contained the enemy in the northeast and northwest, while others coordinated attacks on Octavia and the Eastern Front. The 79th Division aimed to capture the strong point at La Mera Canar through a double envelopment following a bombing attack. Other major strong points were also slated for aerial incursions. Lightning Joe's men slowly made their way into the German emplacements with the support of fighter-bomber aircraft and heavy artillery pieces. Late in the day, Collins judged his troops were ready to march straight into the port with a swift attack. He called in the support of the U.S. Navy for additional firepower to support the ground advance. Before the attack, von Schleiben received a request for surrender, but following Hitler's orders, his honor and that of his men, he refused, and the battle resumed. His battered German troops were in for incessant and lethal naval barrages. While Lightning Joe Collins' 7th Corps attacked the German fortifications from the rear, U.S. Navy and British Royal Navy ships approached the Contentan Peninsula to support the ground troops with a naval bombardment. Task Group 129-2 from the 12th Fleet, under the command of Rear Admiral Morton Deo, arrived at the coast on June 25th to suppress the coastal batteries the Germans were planning to use against the American infantry. The task force immediately got to work in two battle groups. One bombarded German fortifications, while the other neutralized the enemy batteries. Accompanying British ships began sweeping lanes ahead in search of German mines. The German response was fierce. The shore batteries opened fire against the surface vessels, leading the Navy to call in the support of General Pete Casada's 9th Army Air Force to attack the enemy positions. The Allies' ground, sea, and air assets worked together to hammer the Germans. Despite the overwhelming Anglo-American superiority, the defenders held their ground and counterattacked. Army air-controlled gunnery tore apart panzers close to the 7th Corps with swift, decisive blows. Dozens of German pillboxes crumbled under the Navy's wrath and the lethal explosive shells of the naval guns. Battery Hamburg and other batteries northeast of the port retaliated against the minesweepers and other destroyers. They roared revenge and hit several ships, knocking out the radar from destroyer O'Brien and severely damaging three minesweepers and destroyers. Spitfires and Grummans were called in to silence the German guns, but were scattered by accurate flak fire. The imposing USS Texas and Arkansas unleashed several salvos against Battery Hamburg and her four 9-inch guns to no avail. The German gunners waited patiently until the US ships were within range. When they did, they fired mercilessly. One shell struck the conning tower of Texas, leading to 11 casualties. In return, the USS Texas scored a direct hit in Hamburg, removing one of the reinforced gun emplacements. The Wehrmacht's resistance was brave and heroic, but the Germans were surrounded from all fronts, and there was no escape. 
Generals Dolman and von Schleiben contemplated a negotiated surrender, but the suggestion, as expected, was rejected by Hitler. The port of Cherbourg was a fortress and had to be defended until the last man. Although the German troops were exhausted, resistance continued. American troops were received with intense small arms fire from positions behind the creek bed and the surviving pillboxes. Still, the American GIs eventually advanced through the inner fortress with the use of Bangalore torpedoes and explosives. When heavy machine gun fire pinned Company E, 23-year-old Corporal John D. Kelly volunteered to take down the enemy machine gun nest. Kelly slid under enemy fire with a 10-foot pole carrying a 15-pound TNT charge. Despite the first charge having no effect, he remained undeterred. Returning for another charge, Kelly approached the German pillbox and successfully blew off the fortification. Subsequently, Kelly used another charge to blow open the pillbox's back and hurl grenades inside. The few surviving Germans surrendered in the aftermath of the explosions. Due to his selfless actions, Kelly would earn a posthumous Medal of Honor. Nearby, in a fierce encounter, Company K of the 3rd Battalion faced another challenge. Pinned down by machine guns and imposing German 88mm flak guns, 1st Lieutenant Carlos C. Ogden decided to join the fray and save his men. With a rifle grenade launcher for his M1 Garand, Ogden approached the emplacement alone. Despite a bullet severely injuring his head after ricocheting off his helmet, Ogden pressed forward with determination. The GI calmly aimed his rifle grenade launcher and fired with precision, shattering the enemy flak and eliminating most of the crew. Undeterred by a second wound, Ogden then advanced toward the German machine gun nests, neutralizing them with well-aimed grenades. The lieutenant's heroic actions, leading to the garrison surrender that evening, also earned him the Medal of Honor. Food, supplies, and ammunition began to run out for the German garrison, but they kept resisting with admirable spirit. Lightning Joe's troops kept pushing the enemy into submission with the combined arms of air, sea, and ground assets. On June 26th, the British elite troops of No. 30 Commando assaulted Octavia and captured a Kriegsmarine unit of over 500 men. This paved the way for the 79th Division's fearsome attack against the heavily defended Fort de Roule. Standing in a steep rock promontory, the fort provided the Germans with an excellent view of the harbor, but it had already been pummeled by air and sea bombardments. The American soldiers broke through on the west side after making holes with bazookas and pole charges. Realizing that resistance was futile once the fort was breached, Generals von Schleiben and Dolman surrendered on June 29th to Lightning Joe's men. With the port secure, Allied logistics were guaranteed safe passage for the success of France's liberation. Lightning Joe would continue leading the 7th Corps until the war's end and would stay in the army throughout the Korean War before retiring in 1956. Lightning Joe Collins was awarded three Army Distinguished Service Medals and two Silver Stars among his many recognitions. He was credited with destroying 14 German divisions during his service in the Western Theater of World War II.